Loving Counsels, a New Year's Address by John Macduff in 1868. My dear friends, at this season, so long as the state of my health permitted me to address you from the pulpit, it was my custom to direct your thoughts to a consideration of God's goodness in the past and to the duty of more humble trust and confiding reliance on Him for the future. Standing, as it were, on the borderline of two years, I endeavored to point backward to the path along which you had traveled, and, from the countless tokens of God's watchful care, His gracious condescension, faithfulness, and love, I sought to lead you, while erecting another Ebenezer, not only to inscribe on it the words, Hitherto the Lord has helped me, but, with a firmer trust and deeper love, to say, This God is our God, for ever and ever. He will be our guide, even unto death. It has pleased our Heavenly Father to withhold from me the privilege of addressing you this year from my accustomed place. Yet do I feel most grateful that he gives me strength of mind and body, even from the sick room, to discharge a duty so solemn and important, and thus to hold communion with those whom, from my inmost heart, I love so truly. It may be also that the words I now address will not be less welcome or impressive, coming as they do from one who has been lately snatched from the very gates of death, and who has experienced more deeply than language can describe the goodness, the mercy, and the love of God. By His blessing, these pages may be instrumental in awakening in some heart a livelier sense of the divine faithfulness, and a more ardent longing for union and fellowship with our unseen but ever-present Savior. Assuredly, I have no wish so near to my heart, none which so entirely occupies my thoughts and prayers, as that all of us may be united, not only as pastor and people, but as heirs together of the grace of life, partakers of Christ, and children of God by faith in Him. For all of you, my heart's desire and prayer is that Christ Jesus may be formed in you, the hope of glory, and that, by divine grace, you may be enabled to walk worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love. Both as pastor and friend, eleven years of fellowship have united me more and more closely to you in the bonds of affection, and looking back on my ministry, I can say that in every home I met a cordial welcome. From every parishioner I received kindness and sympathy, and that no discord or division has ever weakened my hands or discouraged me in my labors. It would be strange indeed if, with such a retrospect, I could feel otherwise than deeply interested in your present and eternal welfare, if any desire could be stronger than that all of you should be followers of Christ and heirs of everlasting glory. Allow me then, dear friends, while the year is closing in around us and making way for the opening of another, to address to you a few words of faithful, earnest, and loving counsel, and may the Spirit of all grace sanctify and impress them on all your hearts. In reviewing the past, the feeling which, at such a time as this, should be uppermost in every heart is that of fervent gratitude to God for His unmerited goodness and mercy. There are none of us who have not experienced during the bygone year that the Lord our God is gracious. We may have failed to realize and acknowledge it, 
but it is not the less true that every step of our pilgrim path, every hour of prolonged existence, every return of daily comforts and blessings have been so many tokens of God's goodness, so many evidences that His tender mercies are over all His works. In the house and by the way, He has watched over and protected us, and in the midst of a multitude of dangers which our eye could not see nor our arm avert, he has guided and upheld us so that we may well stir up our souls and all that is within us to praise and magnify his holy name. Some of us can look back on seasons of special help and deliverance. We can remember how, when the world, with its temptations and snares, had been gaining an undue ascendancy over us, when faith was wavering, and hope was declining, and love waxing cold within us, when doubt and fears were taking possession of our souls, and we were driven in the very extremity of our peril to cry, Lord, save me, or I perish. Even then, an almighty arm was held out to rescue and uphold us, and a gentle voice whispered, I am still with you. And receiving fresh grace and strength, we bent humbly before the cross, and had our faith invigorated, our love increased, our hope brightened. Oh, surely, with such a retrospect, our language may this day be, whom have I, O God, in heaven but you? And in all the earth there is none whom I desire besides you. Some whom I address may be looking back to times of sad and painful bereavement. The desire of your eye has been removed with a stroke. Death has plucked from its stem the loveliest and fairest flower of your heart and you have felt stunned, bewildered, desolate. But even then, when your heart's sorrow was greatest and your anguish most intense, there came one to your side whose presence soothed and comforted your downcast spirit, one who encircled you in his everlasting arms and whispered words of sweetest consolation. Lo, I am with you always. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. I will restore comforts unto you. I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. Oh, when such words as these have come to you, in the sad and dreary hour of trial, when you have been enabled to feel that, instead of being left forsaken, desolate, and bereft, Christ was never nearer to you than then, never more tender and sympathizing, never more intent upon advancing your best interests and securing your spiritual peace and comfort than at the moment when his dear hand laid your loved one low. You must, on looking back this day to that momentous period in your history, feel and acknowledge he has done all things well. Yes, he robbed me of that cherished jewel that I might find himself, the pearl of great price. He plucked that lovely and cherished flower that I might clasp more tenderly to my heart himself, the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. When I deemed myself forsaken and friendless, he came to offer me a heart touched with my grief, throbbing with a love far deeper and intenser than I could find on earth. He enabled me, by his grace and spirit, to bow in meek and humble submission to my Father's will, to say without one repining word or one murmuring thought, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now I can bear my testimony to the truth. He has done all things well. 
Now I feel in my inmost heart that in faithfulness he has afflicted me. Some of you can look back to a time of sickness when you experienced divine help and consolation, when first you were summoned to retire from the busy throng and from the scenes in which you delighted. All seemed dark and mysterious. The consciousness that health had departed, that disease was progressing, and pain and weariness confining you as a prisoner to the bed of suffering. All this pressed hard upon your spirit and filled your soul with despondency and gloom. The trying dispensation, instead of appearing what it eventually proved, a precious blessing, seemed a dire and heavy calamity. But he who works his purposes of mercy and love towards his children in a way often contrary to their expectations and plans left you not to linger in darkness and despair. He came to you in the night watches. He made all your bed in your sickness. He brought promise upon promise to cheer your drooping spirit. He taught you that your sickness and suffering were needed to refine, elevate, and sanctify you. He taught you that God designed thereby to draw you nearer to himself to wean your affections from the world and bring your will into sweeter and more perfect harmony with his own. Oh, surely, you have good reason this day to bless God for that bed of suffering, that couch of weakness, and those wearisome days and long, sleepless nights, if thereby you have been enabled to realize more fully that God is your all, your portion, your Father, if you have been brought into closer relation and more endeared intimacy and fellowship with Jesus, the sympathizing brother, the tender, loving friend, if you have become more deeply sensible of the Holy Spirit's work within you, of His power to comfort, support, and sanctify you. Looking back upon that eventful period, your feeling now is, I thank God for my trial time of sickness, for calling me away from the busy throng, that I might be alone with Him. Thank you, God, for teaching me my own weakness and your strength, my own emptiness and your fullness, my own sinfulness and your pardoning love my utter helplessness, and your upholding, comforting, and sustaining grace. Thank God that the anguish of that season of pain, distress, and suffering was so often solaced by His love, that its loneliness was so often dispelled by His gracious presence, that its gloom was so often brightened with His smile and that its calamity was so often sanctified by His grace. Thank God that I can now sit loosely to the world, and feel that I am only a stranger and a pilgrim in it, journeying to my heavenly home. Thank God that I can rest in the assurance of having one ever near to whom I can reveal every doubt and care and perplexity, on whose arm I can confidingly lean in coming up from the wilderness, from whose infinite fullness I can at all times obtain strength for duty, patience for suffering, support under weakness, and comfort in the midst of sorrow. His grace is sufficient to bear me up amid all earthly trials and sorrows, temptations and infirmities, and His strength can guide and uphold me in duty, service, and suffering until that blessed hour when, the conflict ended and the victory won, He shall conduct me safely to my eternal home. Come health or sickness, come joy or sorrow, 
as I travel onwards, I can now say, I leave it all with Jesus. But there is yet another class who are, at this season, solemnly called upon to remember with gratitude the goodness and the mercy of God. They are such as have been exempt from painful sickness and sad bereavement, whose paths have been unmarked by trial, and whose homes have been unvisited by the fell destroyer. They have rejoiced in the bright sunshine of prosperity, and the bygone year has been to them uncheckered, serene, and tranquil. Business has prospered. Health has continued unbroken. Their family circle has been undiminished, and everything has gone well with their earthly plans and prospects. Oh, my friends, see to it that with grateful hearts you recognize in your prosperity the good hand of God. It is His love which has so brightened your pathway. It is His love that has filled your cup of blessing. It is His love that has exempted you from trial and sickness and sorrow. It is His love that has crowned the year to you with goodness and shielded your homes from calamity, disease, and death. Let that love flow into your hearts and excite love and gratitude in return. Pray for grace to bear your prosperity with a humble, thankful spirit, to use it for God's glory and for the good of others, and let not the bright sunshine which now gladdens your pathway render you forgetful of the solemn truth, that in a moment the darkness may gather, the storm and tempest beat, and the present calm and serenity be changed for the fierce winds of adversity. Regard every earthly blessing as only lent to you, only for a season. And, should it please God to remove it, O oh, strive to feel and to acknowledge that He only takes from you but what He first gave to you. Remember that He alone can abundantly supply all your needs. Relieve all your wants, compensate for every loss, and help you in every emergency. Above all, see that temporal prosperity is not rendering you less diligent in working out your salvation with fear and trembling, less anxious to make progress in the divine life, less careful in the discharge of pious duties and less watchful against the onsets of temptation. There is a danger in prosperity. There is a peril when the world is smiling upon you, peril from its customs, its businesses, its pleasures, and its friendships, and you can only be safe so long as you continue watchful and prayerful. So long as you are walking with Jesus amid daily duties, enjoyments, and pleasures. By His side, the world cannot harm you. In His presence, its temptations and bribes cannot deceive you. Relying on His grace, prosperity will not ensnare you, nor will worldly success unduly elate you. O oh, pray, then, that you may be enabled to live unto the Lord to live truly, usefully, and acceptably to Him whose you are, and whom you are bound by every tie of love and gratitude to serve. Pray that you may have grace to travel onward through life, with Christ acknowledged in every step, entwined with every affection, as the source of each joy and the sharer of each sorrow of your personal history. Let your walk be one of firm, unshaken faith in your Savior God. Go to His inexhaustible fullness with every need. Go to His tender sympathy with every sorrow. 
go to his prevailing grace with every infirmity. Go to his precious blood with every sin. Draw all your strength and grace from Christ and seek earnestly the aid and anointing of the Holy Spirit. And, whether in prosperity or in adversity, you will be able to accomplish that which will bring glory to God, happiness to those around you, and peace, comfort, and serenity to your own soul. In reviewing the past, the goodness of God will be all the more conspicuous if we reflect on our individual demerits and sinfulness. Instead of loading us with benefits and watching over us with parental care, sustaining and comforting us amid our daily trials and vicissitudes, he might justly have withdrawn his favor from us and left us to reap the fruit of our own doings. How often have we shared in the bounties of his providence without acknowledging the hand which bestowed them? How little have we done to show our gratitude either by the praises of our lips or the devotion of our lives to his service? Where has been the exercise of a living faith? Where has been the exercise of an ardent love? Where has been the exercise of a holy zeal? What progress have we made in our homeward path? What advancement have we made in holiness and purity? Have we loved God's word more? Have we been more fervent and persevering in prayer? Have we been more faithful as the soldiers of the cross? Have we been more animated by the humble spirit of him whom we profess to serve and obey? Has Christ been made more precious to us, and have we been living in close and daily communion with Him, betaking ourselves to Him with every care and doubt and perplexity, ever traveling to the fountain of His precious atoning blood for the pardon of our many sins, and pleading earnestly for more of His sanctifying, sustaining, enlightening, and comforting grace? Alas, who among us is not filled with sorrow and self-reproach as we turn the eye backwards and think of our ingratitude, our unbelief, our waywardness and rebellion, our weak faith, our cold love, our flagging and inconstant zeal? Truly we may say, He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Such has been the marvelous love of God toward us, that though we have questioned and wounded it again and again, it has borne with us, and continued unchilled and unchanged. It has tracked our wandering, devious way. It has hovered around us, and shielded us from danger. His love has guided us in perplexity. It has comforted us in sorrow. It has sustained us amid hourly trials, temptations, and afflictions. Ah, what love has been manifested by our blessed Savior! Love to the sinful and guilty and undeserving! Not only did he shed for us his precious blood and pour out his soul unto death upon the cross, but having risen as the conqueror of sin and death and hell, he entered for us within the veil, appeared as our mediator and advocate with God the Father, and ever lives to plead our cause and to pour out upon us the riches of his grace. Freely has he offered to the very chief of sinners his precious, guilt-atoning blood, his soul-satisfying righteousness, and his sin-subduing grace. He has done all, suffered all, paid all, and left us nothing to do but believe and be saved. 
And oh, what gracious, reviving promises has he given to his people, promises of peace and comfort and hope, promises of guidance through life, support in death, and bliss throughout eternity. He has assured us of the Spirit's help in carrying on the work of faith and holiness within us, in renewing our natures, purifying our affections, and forming within us His own mind and likeness. He has pledged His word that He will never leave nor forsake us, that our union with Him shall never be dissolved, that He will abide with us and in us, that we shall be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, that grace begun shall assuredly terminate in glory, and that neither death nor life, things present nor things to come, shall be able to separate us from His love. O oh, brethren, let us seek to realize more than we have ever done how much we are indebted to our Savior God. Let us strive by the help of the Holy Spirit to know more of that love which passes knowledge. And as we look forward to the future, to that year on which we are now entering, let us humbly and earnestly resolve that, by divine grace, we shall live not unto ourselves, but to him who died for us and rose again, that our life shall be a life of faith, a life hidden with Christ in God. We do not know what the future may bring of joy or sorrow, of weal or woe, but if we have made Christ our portion, our all in all, then we need fear no evil. He will make His grace sufficient for us and perfect His strength in our weakness. He will support us under every trial, guide us through every perilous path, and carry us over every difficulty and danger until He brings us in safety home to our eternal rest. Only let us cling confidently to Him as we travel onwards. Let our communion be close and uninterrupted. Let the eye of faith follow His guiding hand, and the ear of faith listen to His loving voice, and the hand of faith grasp Him with a clinging confidence, and all will be well. Trials may come. He will comfort us. Dangers may arise. He will protect us. Enemies may oppose us. He will overcome them. No weapon formed against us shall ever prosper. The coming year will be one of spiritual progress. Faith will win its victories, and love secure its triumphs, and hope increase its soarings. We will be able to rejoice in the Lord, and rejoice in the God of our salvation. We commit our interests for time and eternity to Him who will make all things work together for our good. We cast all our cares upon Him, knowing that He cares for us. And in so doing, whatever our troubles and trials may be, we will have within us the peace which passes understanding and a measure of that joy which is unspeakable and full of glory. Assured that all the ways of our God are mercy and truth to those who love Him, we will trust His heart, even when we cannot trace His hand. We will receive meekly, humbly, and gratefully whatever He is pleased to send us, waiting patiently for the time when He will solve His own deep and mysterious providences, and we will be able to trace, with grateful hearts, in the light of eternity, how much of infinite love and wisdom and faithfulness and goodness 
were enfolded in all the events of our earthly history. Beloved friends, be it yours to enter on the coming year with the resolution that, whatever others do, as for you and your house, you will serve the Lord. See to it that you erect the family altar, and with your children seek daily pardon for daily sins, and daily grace for daily necessities. Let the word of God be to you a precious treasure, a storehouse from which you daily draw food and nourishment to your soul. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together for the worship of your God and Savior. Go to the sanctuary with humble and teachable spirits. Sit at the feet of Jesus and learn of Him, that you may the better meet the trials and temptations of life, and to better discharge those duties which devolve upon you from day to day. Be earnest and persevering in prayer. Remember that the throne of grace is ever near at hand, and that the ear of the eternal God is ever open to your cry. For you the gate of mercy is ever open, the Savior is ever pleading, the Spirit is ever ready to help your infirmities. Go to that throne, assured that, in Christ Jesus, there is treasured up an infinite, inexhaustible, mediatorial fullness of grace, and that, out of that fullness, you are invited to partake. Go to it in emptiness, and you will return filled. Go to it in sorrow, and you will return comforted. Go to it with guilt, and you will return pardoned. Go to it with sin, backsliding, and infirmity, and you will return healed, restored, and supported. Do not be ashamed to confess Christ in your daily life. Oh, how many are so, afraid to be deemed pious, afraid to be thought of as enthusiasts, afraid lest men should take knowledge of them that they have been with Jesus. They will strive and struggle and toil to acquire earthly riches, give their whole heart's devotion to the world, and waste the energies of mind and body in the effort to outstrip others in the race for wealth. They are not ashamed to be known as worldlings, but they are ashamed to be deemed pious. They can be cold, unimpressed, and indifferent when a pious subject is brought before them, but warm, interested, and engrossed when the conversation is of this world, its business, schemes, and projects. Brethren, let it not be thus with you. Carry your piety along with you, not indeed for ostentatious display or as the subject for mere idle empty talk, but as that which rules and regulates your words and actions, as that which renders you gentle, kind, generous, and forgiving in your daily fellowship with those around you, as that which opens your heart to the call of the needy, and excites your sympathy to the afflicted and sorrowful, as that which renders applicable to your name and character the words of Scripture, All who heard of me praised me, all who saw me spoke well of me, for I helped the poor in their need, and the orphans who had no one to help them. I helped those who had lost hope, and they blessed me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. All I did was just and honest. Job 29, verses 11 through 14 Thus, with Christ in your heart, and Christ's Spirit in your life, be it yours to meet the coming year, and whether your influence is great or small, your sphere of action extensive or limited, 
do what you can to glorify your God and Savior, and to let your light so shine before men that they, seeing your good works, may also glorify your Father who is in heaven. In the family and in the world, at home and abroad, in your disposition, in your business, in your worldly interactions, be it your desire, your aim and prayer, to live unto the Lord, and to serve Him faithfully with your time, your talents, your influence, and your wealth. Let your prayer be, Lord, what will you have me to do? And seek earnestly, humbly, and faithfully to do the will of your Father who is in heaven. So occupy as a steward until Christ comes, and he will then say, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Blessed is that servant who is found so doing the will of God. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I pray that the choicest blessing of Almighty God may rest upon you, upon your families, your friends, your homes, your occupations, your duties. May you receive grace according to your need, grace for doing and for suffering, grace for health and for sickness, grace for prosperity and for adversity, grace for life and for death, grace for time and glory in eternity. May you enjoy in every step of life's pilgrimage the cheering, sustaining, and animating presence of your God and Savior. And may that presence be to you so precious, so needful, so gladdening, that it will prove the pledge of heaven, the foretaste of celestial bliss, and the firstfruits of the golden harvest of eternity. With sincere affection, I remain your loving pastor and brother in Christ. John Macduff, 1868